Thank you for watching another segment in our transthoracic echocardiography series. This one upon how to obtain a normal apical four chamber view. And in obtaining that view, what are some of the basic measurements and quantitative and qualitative information that we can obtain from that view? Also, if you're using the Butterfly IQ, how to use a certain software feature on it to calculate ejection fraction. Thanks for watching and thanks for learning with us. Medical Specialists Associates, making medical education more accessible. Thank you for watching another segment in our transthoracic echocardiography series, and this one upon how to obtain a normal apical four chamber view. And in obtaining that view, what basic measurements can we obtain and that we should be familiar with? Also, if we're using the Butterfly IQ, how to obtain an ejection fraction with the software. So to start with here, let's talk about propositioning and basic anatomy. Well, we're talking about an apical four chamber view. And so we know that the heart lies here in the chest and it points down towards the left nipple. So oftentimes what we do is we start with the probe in this particular region here. And what we wanna do is rock our hand down exactly in the placement of this probe right here and look up at the heart in this direction. Also, each of these probes has a little dot on it. On the other side of this probe is the dot, and we say that the dot should point towards the left shoulder here. So again, now, with the pan rotated down and the probe looking up in this direction, and with the dot towards the left shoulder, we should be able to obtain something that looks like this view. And so what are we looking for? Or what are we looking at? We'll be looking at the left ventricle on the right side of the screen, and then the left atrium separated by the mitral valve. And on the left side of the screen, we'll look at the right ventricle separated by the tricuspid valve and the right atrium up here. And we'll go over these measurements in a little more detail, but we should see that the left ventricle is bigger than the right ventricle. The right ventricle is usually about 60% the size of the left, and the two atria are about the same size. Again, we'll review these in more detail as we go through the talk here. So first here is just your normal apical four chamber view. And what are we looking at? Everything that we just showed on the other slide, but just live here. So here we have the left ventricle. Here we have the left atrium down here. If we watch closely, we have the mitral valve opening and closing. And then on the right side of the heart, uh, right, uh, left side of the screen here, we have the right ventricle here, the tricuspid valve, and here the right atrium uh, as well. So this is what a normal view would look like. So now let's delve into some of the details of what we're going to look for. So perhaps maybe the first thing that we're going to look for here is some left-sided measurements in the parasternal long axis view. And one of the first things I want to show is, is what is the diameter of the left ventricle? How big is normal? And here we show that usually what we do is we take the measurement in end diastole, that's when it's best, and that's also when it's biggest. And what we're looking for here is that in the normal individual, it should be something in the order of less than five centimeters. So here with my measurement across, right at the midpoint of the left ventricle right here, I get a measurement of 4.68 centimeters. So this is normal. We also wanna look a little bit at the shape of the left ventricle. And normally what we would say that if we had to look at the long axis right here and the short axis right here, we would say that the long axis is usually about two thirds the length as compared to one third the length going across the short axis view. And this has a conoid shape. So now what other information can we get? Well, let's say we're gonna look at left ventricular hypertrophy and we wanna have an idea of whether or not this patient has it. Well, we have to look at left ventricular thickness. And in this particular view, what we can usually get is the septal wall right here. And we can measure across the septal wall and get an idea of that, again, that thickness. Here I show that it's about 0.6 centimeters. And the normal is usually between 0.6 and 0.9, with really that upper limit of normal being one centimeter. So this is a view that we can assess for left ventricular hypertrophy. In some of the other videos that I show you in this series, particularly the parasternal short access view, we can maybe get that donut shaped view and put M mode on. 
But what if we can't get that view? This is yet another way to assess for left ventricular hypertrophy. So what else are we interested in? Well, we're also interested in the size of the left atrium. And so again, we usually assess the size of the left atrium in end diastole. And so here is our end diastole right here. And it's usually less than four centimeters. Here I'm showing that it's a size of 3.43 centimeters. Now, as compared to the left ventricle that I said that usually had a coronoid shape, again, two thirds the length, one third the length here, this is usually one third, one third. Uh, one third across here long and one third uh, across here uh, vertical. So now let's just review some of the measurements that I showed here. I said that usually the left ventricular internal diameter at end diastole is less than five centimeters. Wall thickness is usually between 0.6 and 0.9 with really an upper limit of normal maybe being one centimeter. The left atrial diameter is usually less than four centimeters. We expect the left ventricle to be conoid in shape, and we expect that the left atrium to be uh, symmetrical in shape, one third and one third with both dimensions across vertical and horizontal. So now let's get further measurements and assessment. And what we can do now is we can look at our mitral valve and we can put color flow Doppler across the mitral valve. This was taken with the butterfly IQ, and so I can point out some details about what assessments we can get with the butterfly. And so the first thing we want to note is that we show here red um, uh, color going in this particular direction towards the probe. So red goes towards the probe, and this is the blood flow that's coming out of the left atrium and into the left ventricle. Interestingly enough, we also see some blue over here. So what's this blue? This is actually a partial five chamber view and what we're seeing right here is a little bit of the aortic valve coming in, so this is blood actually leaving. And so in this particular uh, view here, what we want to note is, is there any regurgitation or stenosis? So particularly regurgitation, let's talk about here. So one particular thing that we're going to look for is, is there red going this way and is there blue coming back here into the left atrium? And if there's blue coming back here into the left uh, atrium, what do we want to assess for? We want to assess for whether or not there's a jet that's going straight back, or if there's a jet maybe that's going towards the uh, uh, atrial septum, or if there's a jet going away from the atrial septum. What does that information gives us, uh, give us? It gives us information as to what valve uh, leaflet might be effective. If there's flow here going towards the um, uh, atrial septum, maybe there's a problem more so with the posterior leaflet on this side, or if there's flow going away, maybe there's a problem with the anterior leaflet. And again, if there's flow going straight back, maybe there's just a problem with coaptation. The two valves aren't able to come straight together and there's just a hole right in the middle. The other thing we can assess for is the degree of severity of this regurgitation and part of the way that we can assess that severity is how much of the left uh, atrium is being filled with that regurgitant volume. Is it just a little or is it just the, or is it the entire left atrium? At the level of this particular talk, I'm not giving you a bunch of detailed measurements to look for, and this is more just general concepts to look, to look for. And the reason why that is, is because if we're doing more quantitative measurements, well, we're going to have a cheat sheet with all of this information available to us, and we simply look it up in terms of, um, do we call this mild, moderate, or severe regurgitation based upon, say, the volume that's filling up the left atrium, or um, maybe based upon what we call a vena contractor. So now, what is a vena contractor? Well, if there was regurgitation here, then flow would come back here into the left atrium, and then we would see a little um, uh, instance here of the flow to where the valve is open, and that's called the vena contracta. And let's take a deeper look at that on this next slide. And so let's get a definition of what the vena contracta is. And what it is, is it is a point in the fluid stream where the diameter of the stream is the least and fluid velocity is at its maximum. So here we have fluid over here on this particular side, and it's going at a certain velocity. However, the fluid now needs to go from this diameter down to this diameter. 
And in order for it to continue at that same mass going through this smaller diameter, what has to happen is it has to speed up. And so in speeding up, then we'll be able to see this diameter on our color flow Doppler. And so this is what it would look like right here. As blood would go from the left atrium into the left ventricle, it would regurgitate back. And this larger volume here has to go here through this smaller opening. And when it goes through that smaller opening, this is when we would be able to measure the vena contracta. And let's say if we were able to measure the vena contracta, again, not to concentrate so much on the details, but just to get some of the general ideas, because if we were doing this in a real quantitative fashion, we would have all this information available to us. But if we saw a vena contracta, say less than three millimeters, we call that mild. And if it's greater than seven, it's severe. But again, the other way to do this is what I was mentioning, where if maybe you're having a hard time seeing the vena contracta, is how much volume is being filled up in the left atrium. If a very small amount is, less than 20% is being filled in the left atrium, then we say that this is mild. Or contrast, if it's 40% or greater, then we call that severe. So now what we can do in this particular view is we can rock the probe a little bit and instead of getting our apical four chamber view, what we can do is we can try to get the aortic valve into better um, view here. And this would be now our five chamber view. And this is our aortic valve right here. This is our left ventricular uh, uh, outflow track uh, right here. And we would look for the same basic things as what I showed in the mitral uh, valve. We can look to see if there's any regurgitation. Is there flow going back towards the probe after the blood's ejected out of the left ventricle? Um, and we can also look for a vena contracta here as well. In addition, what we can do is we can see if there's any obstruction here by this anterior leaflet right here obstructing the left ventricular outflow tract. We call that systolic anterior motion, or SAM uh, for short. So now let's turn our attention on the right side uh, of the heart and what measurements we can get here. Well, likewise, as on the left side of the heart, when we had left ventricular size, here on the right side of the heart, we can also get the right ventricular side. However, what I told you was, was that the right ventricle is usually smaller than the left ventricle, but also that it curves around the left ventricle normally. Normally what forms the apex of the heart is the left ventricle because the right ventricle is kind of hugging around on it. And because of that, what we can do is we can either measure this at the basal diameter, which is usually bigger, or maybe the mid, which is a little smaller. This particular measurement here is, is more so towards the basal diameter. And so the measurement that I got here was 3.93. So it's you know, within normal limits, it might be like a little slightly big. Um, uh, and again, um, we want to look at that ratio here. I say it's about uh, 0.6 between the size of the left ventricle compared to the right ventricle. And as well, what we can do is here is if we're not able to find another view to get a right ventricular uh, wall thickness, say with a subcostal view with M mode going down, we can get the free wall interview here. And if we put calipers across, we would look and see the size of the left ventricle, I'm sorry, the right ventricle should, you, uh, should be 0.5 centimeters or less. So now, what about the right atrium? Well, again, very similar to the left atrium to where we're expecting that one third, one third view between the horizontal uh, and vertical axes. And the size is roughly the same. Um, we're roughly going to say here something less than four centimeters. Here I show 3.72. These values are a little bit more specific, but I think if we just remember, it's rather akin one-to-one -one with the left atrium. It's a little bit easier to remember. So now, just as we looked at the uh, um, mitral valve, now we can look at the tricuspid valve. And so again, we get the tricuspid valve in view here. We put our color flow uh, Doppler, of course, and we look for the same parameters that we were looking for with the mitral valve. And that is the vena contracta, regurgitation volume, and the location of the jet. And down here, again, I put in some information 
um, uh, if we were going to be uh, strictly quantitative uh, and to be exact. So for example, here, uh, mild regurgitation the vena contracted with is not well defined. And this is because uh, so many individuals have mild regurgitation. It's such a common finding. However, if we saw a very large vena contracta, 6.5 millimeters or greater, then that would be defined um, uh, as severe. Um, however, what I, and again, you can look at the tricuspid valve morphology and the jet. Uh, how much does it fill within the left, uh, uh, within the right ventricle and which particular direction does it go to get an idea as what leaflet might be involved. But interestingly enough now, since this is on the right side uh, of the heart, well, we're going to remember here that this blood flow could flow back into the hepatic system. And so in addition to looking at regurgitant volume, just by looking at the tricuspid valve, you can actually look at the hepatic veins and assess how much blood flow is going back into them as well. One more thing that I want to mention here, which is a popular measurement I go over in some of my other series, is that what we could also do in this particular measurement here is get a TAPSI. So what a TAPSI is, is we look at the tricuspid annulus right here and how much it's moving up and down. And as we do on the right side of the heart, we can do on the left side of the heart. We can get the mitral annulus right here and see how much that's moving up and down. And we call that a MAPSI. To get those values, please see some of our other videos on those topics. So what is interesting with the butterfly IQ is that we can get a ejection fraction using the Simpson methods with the butterfly IQ now. And so what is the Simpson's method? Well, it's the most commonly used uh, approach in clinical medicine to get an, eje uh, an ejection fraction. It's called the rule of discs. And so what we do is, is we line up the heart in both end diastole and end systole right here. And we would cut the heart into many discs and then we get the volume of each of these discs and then add them up. And then we take the ratio between the diastolic and the systolic fraction and we get an injection for an ejection fraction. Well, the butterfly IQ makes this very easy for us, luckily enough, because the computer software using artificial intelligence does all this in the background. I just wanted to show you this particular slide as these are the details technically of what's going on. But what's going on with our butterfly IQ? Well, when we put it on our cardiac uh, preset, there'll be a little button down here for quantification and we click on that. And this is what comes up here for ejection fraction. And so what we do here is we get our apical four chamber view. And what's happening here in the background is, is that these particular images are being saved. And when we're done getting these particular images, then we can begin to scroll through these images. And the first thing, as mentioned down here, is that we want to find end diastole. So it's the first thing we're looking for right here. And so end diastole would be the largest volume. And this is what I chose here as end diastole. Then the next thing we want to get is end systole. And so you hear, see me here looking for the smallest volume. And here I think that this is the smallest volume. And then after doing that, it updates and it tells me my ejection fraction is 64%. Thank you so much for watching and learning with us today. If you're interested in taking this class for credit, or if you're interested in our other services, such as our direct clinical care services, please visit our website at www.med-specialist.net or click on the link in the description below. Also, make sure you subscribe to our channel to stay up to date on our most current content and educational opportunities.